Man, chapter 1 of Acts there, the part that I want to focus on is beginning in verse number 8 where the Bible reads, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And the title of my sermon this morning is A Strategy for Evangelizing the Entire World. A Strategy for Evangelizing the Entire World. And I'm talking about in our natural lifetime, evangelizing the entire world. The Bible says, and if you would flip over to Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says in Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible says in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is known as the Great Commission, our mandate to be witnesses of Christ under the uttermost parts of the earth in all the world and to teach all nations. Now some people when they hear about a strategy for attempting to evangelize the entire world might think that's too big of a goal, that's too big of a vision, that's too big of a job. But honestly I'm going to demonstrate for you first of all before I lay out the strategy, I'm going to demonstrate that number one it has been done, number two it can be done, and number three it will be done. And I'm talking about evangelizing the entire world. I'm going to lay out a strategy to do that. Uh, just actually, point by point, step by step, how to get that done in our lifetime. Now, first of all, let me show you that it has been done. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, the Bible reads, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. So the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1 is talking about the fact that the word of God has come unto all the places in the world, Colossae, and everywhere else, and it brought forth fruit everywhere it went. Now that's obviously talking about the first century AD. We're talking about almost 2,000 years ago. But those men, those 11 disciples and all the other apostles that Jesus ordained and all the other members of the early church, they turned the world upside down in their generation and they preached the gospel in all nations of the world. They evangelized the entire world in their lifetime. There were disciples who went into India and into Asia and into Africa and all different areas and they evangelized the whole world in their lifetime. Go to Romans chapter 1. While you're turning to Romans 1, the Bible says in Acts 19.10, and this continued by the space of two years, referring to some works that the Apostle Paul was doing, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now in that particular scripture when it says Asia, it's not our modern conception of Asia, referring to the continent, it's referring to what would be considered modern day Turkey, the country of Turkey, that's referred to in the Bible as Asia. But it's still a substantial area. It's a great mass of land and it's very populated and it was very populated then. And in two years, the Apostle Paul and the people who worked with him made sure that everybody in that nation, everybody in that Asia Minor peninsula there of Turkey, that they all heard the gospel during that time. Romans chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Flip over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter number 10. You see, the apostles actually evangelized the entire world in their lifetime. Now, some people would look at that and say, well, that was a different job back then because there were only about 200 million people on the earth when the apostles walked. And today we have 7.4 billion people as opposed to 200 million people. So they say, well, now it's, now it's impossible. But it still is possible today because number one, we're starting with more Christians in the first place. We're starting with more soul winners, more churches, more established believers than they did. Number two, we have technology that they didn't have. We have transportation that they didn't have. We have technology where when we go on a missions trip 
we can just go for three or four days and we can do a lot of the legwork and the planning beforehand so that we get there, the appointments are made, the, the baggage is checked, we get there, we've got CDs, we got DVDs, we have all this technology, we have cab drivers waiting for us, we can easily go all over the world, we can be very effective through technology. So even though there are 37 times as many people on the earth now as in the day of Christ, I guarantee you we're starting with way more than 37 times as many believers and faithful soul winners and we have more technology. So yes, it can be done today. Look at Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? It's in Romans 10. This is in the Apostle Paul's day. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So there are a lot of scriptures that talk about the fact that the word of God, even in the first century, had gone into all nations. It had gone into all parts of the world. And remember that miracle at the day of Pentecost allowed people from all nations to hear the word of God. And many of them got saved. Many of them took the gospel back to their home country. Men like the Ethiopian eunuch who, who doesn't, doesn't even factor in as being one of the disciples of the apostles, he took the gospel back home. And the gospel went around the whole world in the first century. So number one, it's been done. Number two, it can be done. And if you would, flip over to Matthew 24, it can be done. While you're turning to Matthew 24, the Bible says in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 10, 27, Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. If God told us to teach all nations, if God told us to preach the gospel to every creature, then it can be done. Because all things are possible with God. And if we ask anything in his name, according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of. If God wants the gospel to the whole, go to the whole world, if we want the gospel to go to the whole world, if we do the work, if we follow the Bible, it can be done because all things are possible to him that believeth. And all things are possible with the Lord. But number three, it will be done. Look at Matthew 24. This is a prophetic passage referring to the end times leading up to the tribulation and the rapture and so forth. And it says in verse number 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. That tells us that the gospel didn't just go around the world in the first century AD, but that before the second coming of Christ, the gospel will once again go around the world and be preached to all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, we all have a part in getting this job done. I don't care if you're a man, a woman, a child, if you're older, I don't care what your, your situation is, your life situation, you can have a part in this task. Now, before I get into the strategy that I've laid out here, let's go to Mark chapter 4, first of all. Mark chapter 4. Because this is all introduction before I lay out the strategy to evangelize the entire world in our lifetime. This is all by way of introduction. First of all, we've seen it's been done, it can be done, it will get done. God wants us to get it done. He's commanded us to get it done. And now I want to show you that we all have a part in this task. Every single one of us has a role to play. You are a part of this. If you're here at Faithful Word Baptist Church or uh, listening to this sermon, you are part of this plan right here. Look at Mark, Mark chapter 4, verse 20. It says, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And... This is referring to the parable of the sower, and I don't have time to expound the whole parable. I've done whole sermons on this where I've expounded it in great detail. But the bottom line is that this fourth category of people, the people whose heart is good ground or good soil, not only do they get saved, but they also bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, trees and plants that produce fruit, They produce fruit once a year, don't they? They don't just pr produce fruit one time and never again, except a few rare plants. Your typical fruit tree will produce fruit on an annual basis. The Bible says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, 
and he that winneth souls is wise. And so this is referring to the fact that if someone is a godly Christian, their heart is right, they're serving the Lord, that many of those people will basically win 30 people to Christ per year, 60 people to Christ per year, 100 people to, to Christ per year. You say, oh, well, what in the world are you talking about? You wicked and slothful person right. who wants to say, oh, the fruit of the Spirit is how I feel. When I feel love, joy, joy, and peace. No, no, no. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. That's the fruit of the Spirit. You're not the Spirit. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. See, everything brings forth after its own kind. Humans produce humans. Animals produce animals. Apples produce apples, right? If an apple tree produces fruit, it's going to be apples. If it falls into the ground and the seeds are there and a plant grows, we know it's going to be an apple tree. Everything brings forth after its own kind. Look, the Holy Spirit, God is love. So the fruit of the Spirit, of course, is going to be love. He's going to bring that forth. He's going to reproduce that. He's the oil of gladness, so he brings forth joy. He's the prince of peace. He's going to bring peace. But to say that, oh, I bore fruit because I felt love in my heart, you know what? That's a wicked and slothful mentality, which is why the world's going to hell today. Right. See, God tells us, son, go work today in my vineyard. He says, go open your mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Go preach the gospel to every creature. But today, we have so many churches where there's no soul winning, there's no real evangelism going on, and they talk about, oh, we're bearing so much fruit, but their tree is just leaves. Right. Why? Because they're not reproducing. I mean, think about it. If a person got married, and, they ha and, and that's a fruitful relationship of marriage, they produce children. That's why God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He's telling them to have kids. Well, spiritually, we reproduce through winning someone to Christ. That's our fruit. Christians produce Christians. That's fruit bearing. That's reproduction. That's a multiplication process that takes place. But the reason why people struggle with this doctrine is because they don't want to do the work. Right. Let's just call it what it is. Yep. Wicked and slothful. Lazy. They don't want to go do the work. They don't want to preach the gospel. So they'll find another. Oh, well, that's not what that means. It can't be about soul winning because they don't want to do any soul winning. Okay, well, let's all be like you then. And then let's, what's, in fact, I'd like to hear your strategy for evangelizing the world, oh, non soul winning one. Right? I, I, let's go down to the church, the Baptist church that doesn't have soul winning. Oh, they got their choir. And they got their Sunday school and their Patch the Pirate and their Awanas. But let's hear their strategy for evangelizing the whole world with the gospel in our lifetime. That'd be a joke, wouldn't it? But was it a joke in the book of Acts? Apostle Paul wasn't a joke. Peter, James, and John weren't a joke. They did it. They accomplished it. They succeeded at it. And so what we see here is that people whose heart is right, they bring forth 30. Not just, oh, they have love. And, and look, love works. If you love somebody, you'll give them the gospel. If you love the Lord, you'll keep his commandment. And his commandment's to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this idea that some bring forth 30, 60, and 100, that's a number. That's a concrete, oh, you find them else with your numbers. Well, I got it from the Bible. Some 30, some 60, some 100. And this is realistic. You know, if you actually show up for soul winning, once a week and even just go out soul winning for one hour per week, you'll probably, if you go to some pretty receptive areas, you could win approximately 30 people to the Lord in the year if you just go soul winning for one or two hours a week. That's pretty accurate. You know, you put in a couple hours every single week, you put in a hundred and some hours. Yeah, you're probably going to win about 30 people to the Lord. Some people that are more dedicated and they, they put in three, four hours a week, yeah, they might see 60 people saved in the course of a year. And then those who are even more dedicated and, and just constantly going soul winning can, can win 100 people to the Lord per year. Okay, that's what this is talking about. So everybody has a part in this because anybody can be a soul winner. And if you've never been soul winning before, it's easy to get started. All you do, you just show up at one of our 11 soul winning times per week and we'll pair you up with somebody and you can just be a silent partner. And that's how everybody gets started. That's how I got started. You know, I showed up at Regency Baptist Church as a 17-year-old boy. 
And, you know, within being there for a couple weeks, I showed up at a soul winning time. I was paired up with somebody, spent a couple hours out knocking doors with that guy, watched him, saw what he did, and then I just duplicated it. And then over time, I got better at it, and I practiced and, and so forth. Some people will be a silent partner for months, and that's no problem. There's no rush to talk. You know, you can spend the first couple months just listening and learning and so forth. Anybody can get involved in soul winning. Or you can come up with a fake doctrine that says that soul winning is not biblical and that bringing forth fruit is just something that you feel in your heart. Is, is that how it works in marriage? Okay, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Oh, where are the kids, Adam and Eve? Well, we're just, we love each other. We're out, don't, can't you see the joy? Look how peaceful we are. Yeah, you lose the peace when you, when, you're multi, when you multiply into nine kids. It's not a peaceful home. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, okay. Now let me break this down to you. And I've done this before, but it needs to be done repeatedly because it's such a, a powerful truth. Winning the world to Christ starts with soul winning. One on one, and you might think, oh, well, if I go out and win one person to the Lord, that's just a drop of water on a hot stove. That, you know, how does that get us any closer to the goal of 7.4 billion? You know, some people might look at that task and think it's just too big of a task, but actually winning one soul at a time is the way that it's going to get done, even in our lifetime. And let me explain to you how. First of all, let me make sure you understand the goal. The strategy is to evangelize the whole world. That's not to get the whole world saved. Why? Because the whole world will never get saved because it's up to the individual to decide whether they're going to get saved. When I say evangelize the whole world, I mean that every person in the world hears a clear presentation of the gospel in our lifetime. That every single person in this world would hear the plan of salvation and be given a chance to accept or reject Christ as Savior. That's what I mean by evangelizing the world. At the end of the day, they have to choose to be saved. But let me give you an illustration just to prove to you how doable this is in our lifetime and just to show you how one-on-one -on -one personal soul winning is the way that it could easily be done. And this is all introduction before we get into the actual strategy. Okay, here's how it works. Let's say we start out, and, and this is, has to do with numbers, has to do with, with exponents, okay? So I'm going to make it real simple. Let's say there's only one saved person in the whole world, which of course we know that that's not true. But let's just say there's only one saved person in the entire world. And that person says, you know what I'm going to do? Every single year of my life, I just want to win one person to the Lord. I'm not even saying 30, 60, or 100, which is what God sets out there as a standard. I'm saying just to win one person to the Lord per year. But I'm not just going to win that one person to the Lord. I'm also going to train them to be like me. I want to fully bring forth after my own kind. So I want to win one person to the Lord per year, and I want to teach that person to be like me, meaning that I want to teach them to be a soul-winning Christian. You know, I get them in church, get them baptized, teach them how to go soul-winning. They could be my silent partner. I want to do that every year for the rest of my life. Now, is that a crazy, wild-eyed goal? That's not a crazy goal, is it? Just, I mean, you got the whole year, you got 365 days, 52 weeks. You just want to win one person to the Lord and teach them how to win other people to the Lord, okay? Well, after one year of that program, how many Christians are there in the world now, if you started with one? Two, right? So then you made that person just like you, okay? Well, now the both of you, you're going to go out and do the same thing next year, right? So at the end of two years, how many people do you have? Four. At the end of three years? Eight, you're getting, getting excited there. Eight, then 16, okay, because we're going to be basically be doubling each year. So we go two, four, eight, 16, right? So then after five years, we've got 32. After six years, we got 64. Now, this isn't necessarily the fastest growing church in America, is it? After six years, we only got 64 people. And other people might look at it and say, you guys, are, how are you going to win the world to Christ in your lifetime You've, won, you've got 64 people in that church. Babe, you still meeting in a strip mall? You know, big deal. Okay. But then after seven years, you're up to 128, right? It's, it's a, it keeps growing, right? So it's doubling. 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,024. Now it's a pretty big army of soul winners, right? Because these aren't just 1,000 people that are saved. These are actually a thousand people who go soul winning. That's great, right? Well, here's the thing. Just to simplify the numbers, 
Once we get about 10 years in, there's a thousand of us. Because we go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. But then it goes 2,000, 4,000, right? We go from 4,000 to 8,000. It keeps doubling, right? So by the time we're 20 years in, there's, we're, we're up to 500,000. Isn't that amazing? And if you do this math, you'll see that it works out. So after 20 years, we're at 500,000 people. Just by winning one person to the Lord, if every Christian just wins one person to the Lord per year, and we're only starting with one person, okay? Then after 21 years, we're up to a million, two million, four million, because we keep doubling, eight million, 16 million, 32 million, 64 million, 128 million, 256 million. So by the time we get to year 30, 500 million. 500 million of us. After 30 years of ministry, we only started with one guy. Only just trying to reach one person per year. 500 million, a billion, year 32, 2 billion, year 33, 4 billion. At that point, <laughs> you know, it, you'll never get to 4 billion. You know what I mean? Because, you know, people are going to be rejecting it at that point. But at that point, everybody would have heard the gospel so many hundreds of times. It'd be like, I know! Everybody would either be saved or a reprobate at that point. I mean, they've heard the gospel that many times, right? You know, what the, you know what this number tells me when I look at these numbers? You know what it tells me? It tells me that 99% of Christians bring forth no fruit. They bring forth zero fruit. And there's a false doctrine out there that says, well, every, every Christian brings forth fruit. Oh, really? Well, then, okay, then how come the whole world's not evangelized then? The whole world should be saved then. Because it's not happening, that's why. Because this shows me, because there are way more than just one or two or four or eight Christians in the world. This shows me that the vast, vast, vast majority of Christians never win anybody to the Lord and dead sure never teach them how to be a soul winner. That's where the failure is happening. The failure is happening at the personal soul winning level. It's not because we didn't get enough airtime on the television or we didn't rent enough stadiums and have enough crusades. No, no, no. One-on-one -on -one soul winning, it's biblical, it works, it's easy. Any man, woman, boy, girl can do it. And it can and will get the job done if we would actually do the work. Right. It can be done. So you see that in less than 30 years, easily the whole world could hear the gospel tons of times to the point where there's billions of people that are saved if people would actually do the work. So, and if that went over your head, you know, see me after the service and I'll explain it to you with a calculator or something. But anyway, to, to, seriously, to help you out with that. Okay, so here, let's get into the actual strategy itself. I mean, are we convinced that it can be done? It can be done. Don't, don't have a negative attitude. We can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us. Okay, so here's the strategy. Acts chapter number one is where we're going to find our strategy here, okay? Because Acts chapter one breaks the job into four components. And I'm going to go through each of those four components as quickly as possible. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. And these are the four points, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we have four stages there, but I'm going to apply those to our church. Because this plan that I'm going to lay out is a strategy for our church, just our church, and our friends and the people that we influence and the guys that we send out to start churches, just our friends, us here, our church, how we are going to evangelize the whole world in our lifetime. And look, there are, there are 6,000 other Baptist churches or independent. There are 6,000 independent, fundamental King James Baptist churches in America that have nothing to do with us, that have no affiliation with us, that are not part of this plan at all. So whatever they do, that's just icing on the cake. I mean, we're going to do it ourselves. I don't want to rely on them to do it. They've been dropping the ball for years. They've been dropping the ball for decades. You want to sit back and count on them to get it done? Oh, 6,000 other people, they'll do it. No, they won't. But whatever they do is great. The more they do, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope, I hope they do it. I hope everybody gets the same vision. But let's, let's, just, let's just consider that we're going to do it ourselves. What do you think? Amen. Let's get it done. Amen. Let's not count on other people to do it. So, so 
if, if this is our starting point then, right, the, those of us that are in this room today, then our Jerusalem is Phoenix then, right? So the greater Phoenix area is our Jerusalem, Maricopa County. Then our Judea, we'll call that Arizona itself. Then Samaria would be basically like the next state over because Jerusalem was in the province of Judea. Samaria is like the next state over. So our Samaria, let's just consider the United States, all the other states, the other nearby provinces. California is our Samaria. Texas is our Samaria. New Mexico is our Samaria. Really all of it. A bunch of Samarias, right? Mm -hmm. So we got Jerusalem, Phoenix, Judea, Arizona, Samaria, the USA, and then the uttermost part of the earth is the rest of the world, right? Okay, how are we going to get it done? Okay, stage one is Jerusalem. How are we going to get Jerusalem done? What do I mean by evangelizing Phoenix? I mean that we knock every single door in our county, the doors of over four million people, and attempt to present the gospel to them. Okay, you say, is that even possible? Well, look at that map back there and look how much we've already done. We've already done, that map represents three million people and we've already put a huge dent in that map. We've knocked the doors of way over a million people on that map. And many parts of that map, the, the poor areas, the receptive areas, we've literally knocked seven times. Town of Guadalupe, we've done it seven times. This whole section of South Phoenix, we've done it seven times. My subdivision, this part of Tempe, we've knocked seven times. But at least everything that's shaded orange on that map has been knocked at least once. Not with a door hanger, not with a tract, not with a flyer, but an actual, if you died today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Gospel presentation. So step one of the program is that we need to knock every door in our city, and by that I mean the whole area, and preach the gospel. The Bible says in Acts 5.42, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. If they evangelize the world in their lifetime by preaching the gospel in every house, if we're going to duplicate that, that's what we need to do. We need to preach the gospel in every house. We need to be in the highways and the hedges winning people to Christ through soul winning. We're already on track. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that point because we're already on track for that. We've got the map. It's shaded in. Our, our, we're, 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 we're sending out over 200 people a week. We're, I mean, that thing's getting shaded in so fast. We're on it. Okay. Number two, stage two, Judea, the rest of Arizona. What's the strategy? Well, I've broken this one into part A and part B. Part A is, and if you would go to Mark chapter number one, Mark chapter number one, okay, so stage one, Phoenix. That's pretty self-explanatory. Stage two is our Judea. What's the strategy to reach the rest of Arizona? And by the rest of Arizona, I'm talking about every little town, every little village, every Indian reservation. I'm talking about reaching the entire state with the gospel. Also, the other big cities, Tucson, Yuma, Flagstaff, etc. Okay, the first strategy is that we knock every door in every small town and we knock every door in every Indian reservation in the state of Arizona. Look, this is biblical. Look at the Bible here. Mark chapter 1, verse 38. This is Jesus speaking. He said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. So Jesus Christ and his disciples are moving from town to town, small villages, and Jesus is constantly saying to them, let's go to the next town. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 6, just a few pages to the right. While you're turning there, I'll read for you from Luke 13. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. So Jesus is working his way across Israel toward Jerusalem, just hitting every small town, every village, every hamlet between there and Jerusalem. Mark chapter 6, verse 6, he marveled because of their unbelief. Watch this. And he went round about the villages teaching. So this is part of our mission today. If we're going to fall in the footsteps of Christ, where Jesus Christ said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. If we're going to follow him, we will. Be and by the way, he didn't say you might become fishers of men. He said, if you follow me, you will be fishers of men. And that tells me anyone who's not a fisher of men, not following Christ, right. not following him. 
I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying you're not following his example. You're not his disciple. You're not following in his steps. He went throughout all the villages, all the towns, teaching and preaching the word of God. Acts chapter 8, you don't have to turn there, verse 25, and they, when they had testified, this is the apostles who duplicated that worldwide, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans, okay? So, we want to reach the whole world with the gospel, we need to start right here. Number one, we knock every door in the greater Phoenix area. Number two, we expand that to Judea by reaching the whole state. Now, what are we doing to get this done? Well, we've already knocked the doors in about 12 small towns so far in Arizona, but we need to get them all done. And we've got the chart back there, 21 Indian reservations in the state of Arizona. Four of them are completely done. We've, we've started, I think, 18 out of the 21. We've at least done some soul winning in 18 of the 21 reservations, but we've got a binder, we've got a chart, we're going down it like a checklist. I'm serious about this. I want our church, not another church, I want our church to knock the doors of every single Indian who's living in every Indian reservation in this whole state of Arizona. Amen. I'm talking about the Navajo reservation, the Hopi reservation, the Salt River, the Apache, all of it, the Wallapai, everything. Let's do it. Amen. We're going to get it done. Small town soul winning marathons in every small town. We've already knocked out 10 or 12 of them. We're going to keep that going. We're going to keep hitting more towns with that. But the other part of our strategy for reaching our Judea is that there are some large cities in Arizona that need their own church. You know, it's not, it's, it's not just a small town where you can show up and knock every door over the course of a day or two and at least get everybody the gospel the big cities, and I, I've identified five strategic cities where we need to start churches in Arizona as part of our plan to, to get the gospel to the whole state. And we need a church in Tucson. That goes without saying, right? About a million people down there. It's a big place. We need a church in Tucson, Yuma, Flagstaff, Prescott Valley. Check. All right. We've already got, we already sent Brother Dave Burson's up there. And so he's taking care of Prescott Valley. And by the way, he's knocking every door up there. Amen. You know, that area, that Tri-City area, has approximately 125,000 people in it. He's knocked the doors of tens of thousands of people already with his church. And they're getting the job done up there. It's a big job. It's, 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 it's laborious, but they're getting it done. Prescott Valley, so again, Tucson, Yuma, Flagstaff, Prescott Valley, and Bullhead City. If you put churches in those five areas, you could cover most of the state and, and have a good church within a reasonable distance to hit all these doors, reach people, get people saved, baptized, train them, etc. That would be a good way to at least get everybody the gospel one time. So the first half of that is the small town soul winning and the Indian ministry. And then the second part of that would be starting churches in those five cities, one down, four to go. Okay. Number three, go to Titus chapter one. So we're, 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 we're laying out a strategy for evangelizing the entire world today in our lifetime. Part one, Jerusalem. We've already put a massive dent in that. We're on track, we're getting it done. Number two, Judea. We're getting it done, we've got a plan, we're working on it, we've got a strategy. Okay, but now we're just getting a lot bigger here when we move on to stage three. Now when we talk about Samaria, we're talking about the United States. That's a huge job. Mm -hmm. You know, the Arizona job, we, I think we have a pretty good grasp of that. Yeah. We've got a good handle on that. I mean, I, I'll, be, I'll, I'll put it this way. I'll be surprised if we don't get that done. I'd be shocked if we don't finish the job here in Arizona. But let's not just stop at Arizona. Does, does Acts chapter 1 verse 8 stop at Judea? No, no we don't want to stop at Arizona. We want to think big. We want, to, we want to lengthen our cords and strengthen our stakes and, and increase our vision for, for reaching the world with the gospel. So we move on to the bigger task of Samaria, which is the entire United States of America. You say, Pastor Anderson, yeah, it's crazy. 320 million people. We're going to get it done. Here's the plan. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting 
and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So the Bible is telling us here that the, the, that the game plan for Crete was to ordain elders in every city. In order to reach America with the gospel of Jesus Christ, here's what we need to do. We need to model the way here in Arizona by reaching our entire state based on points one and two, and then we need to start churches across America that will do the exact same thing in their area. Meaning that in whatever the area, let's say, for example, let's just pick a, a, a city, for example. Let's just say, you know, Boston, Massachusetts, right? That means that there would be a church that would be planted in Boston, Massachusetts, that is a soul-winning church, that would say, we're going to knock every door in the greater Boston area. And then they would send out small town soul winning campaigns and reach whatever, I don't know if they have Indian reservations in Massachusetts or not, but just whatever the small town, whatever the, the rural ministry to, to do the soul winning like we do, where we drive hours away and knock every door, you know, that they would take responsibility for their city, their state, and then any other key cities in Massachusetts, they would establish independent Baptist churches in those key cities as well to, to just get that state done. You know, same thing in Utah. You know, somebody plants a church in Salt Lake City. They, they say, we're going to knock every door in Salt Lake City. Then they send out the small town soul winning. They do the Indian reservations. I know there's Indian reservations in Utah. And then they also would start it in other few strategy, strategic major cities in that place. You say, well, how many churches are we going to need to get this done. How many faithful word Baptist type churches that get this same vision, same attitude, is it going to take to get the job done? Well, I identified 53 strategic cities for us to have a goal personally of our church that we are going to want to start churches in these 53 places. And look, I'm not talking about a denomination here. These are totally independent. Once we start these churches, we cut the umbilical cord. You know what I mean? Like, you know, when we sent Brother Romero to Fort Worth, Texas, we have zero authority over him, zero financial ties with him. There's no, we, we are equals is what we are. This, the, the plan is to basically treat each other as equals. You know, Brother Romero, Pastor Anderson, we're equals, right? We're just, we're just both pastors. We're both independent. He's doing his thing in Texas. I'm doing my thing over here in Phoenix. Brother Jimenez is doing his thing over in Sacramento. Pastor Burzens is doing his thing up in, in Prescott Valley. See, the mistake, other people have had great visions in the past, but the mistake they made is by centralizing power. And then on the way to getting this job done, what happens? It gets corrupted, power corrupts, and it ends up uh, going south and going bad and, and, and falling apart. No, 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 we've got to remain independent. Each church takes care of its own area, its own city, its own state, its own evangelism. Stay independent. Look, we're independent Baptists. And that's not just a slogan. Independent fundamental Baptists. No, no, we're actually independent. Amen. We really are fundamental. We actually are Baptists. Those aren't just words. This really is a church, you know? We really are leaning. We are really holding fast the faithful word. And by the way, the only faithful word is the King James Bible, by amen. the way. Let's throw that in there for, for good measure. The only one that you can trust, amen? amen, the King James Bible. So the point is that we're not talking about a network of churches. We're talking about 53 independent Baptist churches. But here's the thing. Everything breaks forth after its own kind. If we send them out, they're going to be like us. And the ones that aren't like us, well, we'll replace them with somebody else and send out somebody who is like us. Not connected to us, not under our authority, but just like us, because we're going to reproduce ourselves. I've identified 53 key cities. And if these 53 cities would get a, a, a church that would do 
what we're doing here at Faithful Word. Look, we're, it, this isn't just a theory. We're doing it. Right. And we can say, look, what we're doing. Do the same thing. If these 53 cities would get a church that would do the same thing, we would get the gospel to every person in America. And many people would get it many times. But I'm saying at least once. Just our movement. Just us, just our friends, just the people that we influence from this little Baptist church in Tempe, Arizona. Let me give you the list of 53 cities. Number one, and these are in our order of pretty much the population or importance or strategy. Number one, New York City, you know, needs this kind of church that would get a big vision and, and get the job done, right? Number two, Los Angeles, California, for crying out loud. Number three, Chicago. It's huge. Number four, Baltimore. Number five, the San Francisco, San Jose Bay Area. Number six, Boston, Massachusetts. Number seven, Dallas, Fort Worth. Check. Brother Romero, he's got this vision. He's doing the small town soul winning. He's got the map on the wall. He's shading in the streets. He's getting it done over there. He's excited about it. He's working hard. His church is behind him. Dallas, Fort Worth. Check. Eight, Philadelphia. Nine, Miami. Ten, Houston, Texas. Eleven, Atlanta, Georgia. Twelve, Detroit, Michigan. Thirteen, Seattle, Washington. Fourteen, Phoenix. Done. So we really don't have to start 52 because we're already here. Fifteen, Minneapolis. Sixteen, Cleveland. Seventeen, Denver. Eighteen, San Diego. Nineteen, Portland, Oregon. Check. Because Brother Jimenez, Verity Baptist Church, they're planning a church right now in Vancouver, Washington, and that church plant, they already have a very strong soul winning program going on in uh, Vancouver, Washington, which is a suburb of Portland, Oregon. They don't like it when you say that, but that's what it is. <laughs> 20, Orlando. 21, St. Louis, Missouri. 22, Pittsburgh. 23, Charlotte. Some of you are taking notes. No, get the tape. <laughs> I'm just joking. 24, Sacramento, California, check. Verity Baptist Church is killing it in Sacramento, California. Uh, it's 25, Salt Lake City, Utah. 26, Kansas City, Missouri. 27, Columbus, Ohio. 28, Indianapolis, Indiana. 29, San Antonio, Texas, check. Brother Manly Perry. And here's the great thing about Brother Manly Perry. We didn't, or we didn't even send him out. He's a guy who basically came out, kind of came out of the old tired, dying, independent fundamental Baptist movement, but he's one of us. He's like us. He's got our same vision. He wants to do the same kind of works, and he's a great preacher, great man of God. So I would say that's check, done. San Antonio, I, be I believe that Brother Perry will do the work and get the job done. Praise the Lord. Okay, number 30. Am I on the right part of the list here? Number 30, Cincinnati. 31, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. 32, Milwaukee. 33, Nashville. 34, Jacksonville, Florida. Now, we don't have anybody there now, but Brother Tyler Baker, our deacon, is starting a church in Jacksonville, Florida, starting August 6th. He's already got literally like 75 people just waiting for him to start the church that are just, they've already said, we're, we're ready to be members. So he should be running uh, 75 from day one. He's going to have a soul-winning army from day one, you know, God willing. Praise the Lord. We don't want to count our chickens before they've hatched, amen? But he is planning on starting the church on August 6th in Jacksonville, Florida. Check. Louisville, Kentucky. Hartford, Connecticut. Number 37, New Orleans. I just found out about a great pastor in New Orleans that, that is our friend now. His name's Pastor Joe Major. Uh, Faith Baptist Church in Violet, Louisiana, right outside New Orleans. We're teaming up with him for a great big soul winning marathon on June 2nd. So New Orleans, check. He's got a big vision, soul winning. He's preaching hard. And by the way, these aren't just soul winning centers. These better be centers of hard preaching. Amen. Because that's the only way to succeed at the mission. Right. People think like, oh, let's just do evangelism. Quit preaching so hard. You're turning people away. You know what? The ones who do evangelism with no hard preaching, they fail because their church has become cesspools of iniquity. Right. They become dens of iniquity. If you don't have the hard preaching, you're going to be filled with fornicators and sodomites and drunks before you know it. And you're not going to get anything done for the Lord like that, my friend. And if you want the proof, 
Just go down to the liberal church that won't preach hard on sin and show me how much soul winning they're doing. Show me how they're succeeding at evangelizing. They're not because when there's that much sin and iniquity abounding, then the love wax cold. And then the work doesn't get done because people become lovers of their own selves in places like that. So you have to have the whole program. This sermon's only about soul winning. Other sermons against sin coming to a pulpit near you. Okay, so New Orleans, check. 38, Grand Rapids, Michigan. 39, Columbia, South Carolina. 40, Oklahoma City. 41, Memphis. 42, Albuquerque. 43, Birmingham, Alabama. 44, Richmond, Virginia. 45, Fresno, California. 46, El Paso, Texas. 47, Honolulu, Hawaii. I can hear the Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Can we get someone to surrender to the ministry now? No, I'm just kidding. Everybody's like, I, th I think God's calling me. You know, April 2017, God called me to Honolulu in that service when Pastor Anderson was given a strategy to reach the whole world. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. All right. Honolulu, Hawaii. Now I got your attention. You're like, man, I think I could preach. You know? All right. 48, Omaha, Nebraska. 49, Little Rock, Arkansas. 50, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 51, Des Moines, Iowa. 52, Boise, Idaho. 53, Buffalo, New York. 54, Anchorage, Alaska. Look, if you had churches in these 53 cities, I'm telling you, you could reach America with the gospel of Jesus Christ if they would do what we're doing here. If they would do the same thing from those 53 places. You will get it done. Now you say, well, my hometown's not on the list, you know, or the, the city that I care about is not on the list. Well, obviously these could be adjusted a little bit. You know, you could do a nearby city instead or whatever and still reach out. Plus, if you remember, these 53 churches, remember, they're going to send out like five churches of their own each, sort of like we're going to hit Tucson, Yuma, Prescott, Flagstaff. You know, they're going to send out churches too. So it's going to just start. These are just the 53 bases that I would recommend. Obviously, this could be adjusted. I'm just saying this list of 53 could get it done. If you look at a map, and I have, if you look at the statistics, and I did, it works. This is a strategy to reach America with the gospel. You say, well, how long is it going to take? Well, let me give you a possible timeline. I believe, that, let me just break it down to you this way. I believe that in four more years, we will have that map done in the back right there. That's my goal. I would like to see that entire map shaded in in the next four years. I believe that that's just realistic. I'm not trying to get crazy or anything. Based on the rate that we're going and the fact that our soul winning has doubled in the last year, I think we can get that done in about the next four years. And I believe we can get the Indian reservations and small towns done in about the next four years. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to do it all again. But I believe realistically the next four years we get that done. That would be the year 2021. We would have our small towns done, Indian reservations done, and our city completely done. Praise the Lord. Okay, now, the next, and, and by the way, that would be 15 years into Faithful Word's existence, because right now our church has existed for 11 years. So that would be 15 years in. My original goal was to do it in 20. I think we'll get it done in 15, because it's going fast. Get it done, okay? But as far as the second part of the Judea plan, that's going to take longer. I don't, four years from now, I don't think we're going to have a church in Tucson, Yuma, Flagstaff, and Bullhead City. That's, that's unrealistic that we would start all four of those churches within the next four years. So I would say to give us nine years. In nine years, I believe we'll have those four churches probably started in the next nine years. So that would be 20 years into Faithful Word's existence or the year 2026. Now, what about the USA? How long is it going to take us to get to these 53 red-hot, soul-winning churches in existence? How long is it going to take to get to that point? I believe that that will be probably in the next nine years. Now, the reason I say that is because of the fact that right now we have a lot of great preaching ability in our church right now. Are you still there in Titus? Now, you see those qualifications there in Titus? 
And you're familiar with the similar passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that goes through the qualifications. Now, you'll notice that preaching ability is only a very small part of this. Did you notice that? Apt to teach over in 1 Timothy 3. Apt to teach. But do you notice how there's a lot more to being a pastor than just being able to preach well? Now, right now, we've got a great preaching class. We've got about 35 guys that come on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock right here. And if you're interested in getting into the preaching class, see me after the service. See me tonight. I'll get your email. We'll get you on the list. We'll get you coming on Tuesday nights. But we've got about 35 guys in that preaching class. And I know there's other guys who can't make the class who are also training to preach. And let me tell you, I've been really impressed by the sermons coming out of that class. And, the, you know, those of you that are in that class, and there's no spectators allowed because we, we don't want people to be getting stage fright. But there have been some great sermons coming out of that preaching class. I, I've been impressed. It's been good. It's been the best preaching class in the history of our church. We've had like 35 guys in there, and many of them have great preaching ability. But here's the problem. Here's why we're not just shipping these 30 guys out, because they don't meet the other qualifications. That's the hard part, folks, is finding the people that meet the other qualifications. Now, one of the qualifications is not a novice. Novice means newbie, beginner. I would say that the average guy in our preaching class that's getting behind the pulpit and preaching great sermons, the average guy in our preaching class has only been saved for about three years. He's not ready to pastor a church, is he? But four or five years from now, is he going to be ready? You know what? That's up to him. If he does the Bible reading, if he stays faithful, if he keeps going soul winning, if he stays right with the Lord, if he walks in the spirit, you know, many of these guys and many of them are going to be castaways, right? Many of them are going to fail. Many of them are going to drop out of the ministry, drop out of church altogether. That's just life. But I believe that many of them and many more that will add over the next few years will step up to the plate. And so I think it's very realistic that in nine years, all 53 of these churches will exist. And you could pull out this, this recording in nine years and, and we can check our progress. But I believe that all 53 of these churches will exist in nine years, both through us sending people out to start churches from here, also some of the churches that we've sent out to start to bring forth kind of the grandchildren churches, right? Does everybody understand what I mean by that? And then also... Some of these people from the old dying independent Baptist movement can still be turned to the truth. They can still be turned away from this dead, lame, kind of uh, compromised stance that most of them are taking. You know, they can, because look, I came out of that movement. You know what I mean? I, I came out. Now, most of them, there's no hope for them. And that's why we need to focus on winning people. You know, it's funny. I walk into Steadfast Baptist Church. Uh, you know, because I was just there preaching on, on uh, Friday night in Fort Worth, Texas. And you know what everybody's saying to me in that church? Church is packed. Church is thriving. Everybody, this is what they're saying to me. Oh, I got saved eight months ago. Got saved three months ago. Got saved a year ago. Got saved two years ago. Got saved three years ago. Got saved four years ago. You know what that tells me? That tells me that the red hot soul winning churches here in Phoenix and Fort Worth, Sacramento, they're not filled with people from the old movement because those people are backslidden. It's mainly new believers that are just getting trained right from the beginning. That's what we need to focus on. But if we can turn some of these other people around or be a good influence on them or if they can be a, a get on board with our vision, and I'm not trying to, 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 to lord over them or talk down to them. I'm saying just to, just to be our friends and, and get our vision and do the same type of stuff we're doing. Because look, I came out of that same movement And hopefully some of these other guys can come around. And, and I've, I've noticed over the last three months, a lot of pastors are starting to get in touch with me over the last three months and, and wanting to be our friend and wanting to, to, to learn from us and wanting to spend time with us and, and wanting to, you know, compare notes and, hey, let's talk. Let's, let's iron sharpen iron here. Whereas, you know, for the last 11 years, they, they haven't wanted to touch us with a 10-foot pole. You know, that's just the true story. So... What's the point? What am I saying? I'm saying that through a process of us sending out guys to start churches, through a process of the churches that we send out sending out people to start churches, and through a process of other people in the old independent Baptist movement being sent out of their home church 
but getting on board with our style of hard preaching and, 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 and hard soul winning. That's a new term we need to invent. But yeah, there's soul winning and then there's those who soul win hard. And I don't mean we're hard on the people that we reach. Obviously, we, we're gentle and we speak the truth in love and we're very gentle and kind. But I say hard as in we don't go for 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Let's go for a few hours. Let's go, let's go a couple times a week. Let's drive a few hours away and do it. Let's, let's do everything. Amen. Soul winning hard. I think, I believe that realistically those, you know, and, and again, this is all according to the will of the Lord, you know, this is all relying on him to keep us and sustain us and bless us. If he removes his blessing, we can do nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. We got to abide in the vine, right? But if we continue in, in, in the works that we're doing, I believe in nine years, all 53 of these churches will exist and a lot of other churches that I haven't even envisioned will exist as well, I believe, realistically. So what does that mean? Well, if each of those churches repeats steps one and two, which took, which is taking us approximately 15 years to perform, then that would mean that in 25 years total, the whole United States, if, if you crunch all the numbers here, by the year 2041, the whole nation would, every door would be knocked in America. Every door knocked in America by the year 2041. That's 24 years from now. It's pretty cool, right? 24 years from now, wouldn't it be great if every single door in America was knocked, not just by anybody, but by one of us. Amen. People that have been influenced by this ministry, people that have come to this church or that believe like us, have been influenced by us, just our group, just our friends, let alone all the other denominations or other styles of Baptists, or, and they have their place and God's using them too, but I'm just talking about us getting it done. Let's just us get it done. Let's not rely on them. Okay, I got to hurry. Step four, the uttermost part of the earth. So everybody understand step one, getting, getting to Phoenix. Step two, Arizona. Step three, let's do the same thing all over America and reach the whole nation in 24 years. Let's just say 25. We'll have one year of just kind of screwing up or making mistakes. Okay. <laughs> We're just being realistic. And then uh, number four, the uttermost part of the earth. Now, I don't have a lot of time. I'm not going to sit here and go country by country like I did with all the cities because we're, we're out of time. But I've looked at the list of countries. I've gone over it. I've examined it. I've thought about it. And let me tell you, just, just before we even get into this, what are, what are we already doing? What we're already doing is that, number one, through putting the sermons on YouTube and on the Internet, we literally have listeners in every country on earth. There are, there are people who listen to this uh, pulpit in every country on earth, literally. Like, I, I mean, I'm talking about Afghanistan, Russia, India, the, every part of Africa. I mean, there are people in every place on this earth who tune in. Secondly, we've already translated preaching and, and documentaries and so forth into 115 languages. Just our church, just, just little old Faith Forward Baptist Church. We translate stuff into 115 languages, which, by the way, is every major language in the world and some weird languages. Because, for example, Google Translate only has 90 languages. And even some of the ones on Google Translate are very obscure languages that aren't really that big, really tiny. We've, we've got 115 of them where we at least have something in that language. Just to give you one example, besides our brother here that's from uh, Albania that helped us with that Albanian translation, just to give you a small example, just the Spanish translation of After the Tribulation Alone, Después de la Tribulación, that video, there's one YouTube upload of that, just one upload, because it's been uploaded on many channels. One upload on a channel called Simon Peter, that channel, that movie, Después de la Tribulación, has 10,074,000 viewers on one channel. The English version doesn't even have that many views. I think the English version, if you add them all up, maybe has like 5 million viewers. Spanish has 10 million viewers. Not to mention the fact that that movie was played on television in Nicaragua multiple times. Not to mention all the DVDs that we passed out of that thing and shipped out of that thing of the Spanish. You know, that's a great example. But I'm saying we've got stuff in 115 languages. All those DVDs back there on the shelf of the Framing the World films have subtitles in 32 languages each. 
And, I'm, and, and many of them are dubbed, fully dubbed into those languages, not even just subtitles. But not only that, we've already traveled to a lot of foreign countries and made a huge impact preaching to thousands of people in schools, churches, door-to-door -door soul winning, South Africa, Botswana, Guyana, just all different missions programs and so forth. We've also been in the media in most major countries. Sermons preached in this church have gone viral in the media in most countries. For example, when I preached a sermon against Iceland being a den of fornication and iniquity, that sermon, I think, was probably heard about by virtually every person living in Iceland. Because there's only 300,000 people who even live there. And it was in all the Iceland newspapers and, and online and the YouTube was viewed and everything like that. So, you know, Iceland got that message. <laughs> But Iceland's not a receptive place to, to anything spiritual, unfortunately. It's one of the most wicked countries on the planet, by the way. So we've been in the media in most countries. I mean, we were on the front page of the newspaper in South Africa, Botswana, Malawi, a bunch of places. And just throughout the last, you know, we're on the, we were in the, the, the main newspaper in France, lots of different places over the years. But here's the strategy. And, and also, by, one other thing that we're already doing, we ship out big boxes of CDs, DVDs, and flash drives to foreign countries every single week. We're shipping out a big box. We're shipping a box to the Philippines, you know, everywhere. He knows because he's, he's saying, yup, because he's packing the boxes. So, you know, you know. We're shipping, I mean, we're shipping, we're shipping a large flat rate priority box now of DVDs or flash drives to the Philippines every single week to, to missionaries and preachers over there that are just killing it and doing a great job in the Philippines. Now go if you would, I, I got to hurry, I'm almost out of time, but go if you would to Acts 13, Acts chapter 13. So what's the strategy for the uttermost part of the earth? I don't have time to go into the details. I talked about a little bit of what we're already doing. But in a nutshell, the strategy is obviously eventually to start churches that are like Faithful Word Baptist that would repeat steps one, two, and three in their own country. They would do the same thing, steps one, two, and three in their country. But one strategy that I want to point out that I think is important for us to understand and realize as a church is that as we try to evangelize the world, we need to start with the countries where it is the most receptive and where it is safe and legal. Now you say, what, are you some kind of a baby? You only want to go places that's safe? You only want to go where it's legal? Well, here's the thing. If we haven't finished that which is safe, and if we haven't finished that which is legal, why would we go to the illegal? Because guess what? If we focus on that which is receptive, safe, and legal, by the time we get to the ones that are not receptive, not safe or not legal, you know what will eventually happen in those places? It could become receptive, it could become safe, or it could become legal. Hopefully it'll become all three. And look, if God's look, just think about it. If God's looking down from heaven and he sees us just tearing it up, just getting the gospel to every person in Guyana, oh, whoops, every person in Guyana, every person in Jamaica, every person in Botswana, every, you know, in all the places where it's safe, it's legal, and it's receptive, don't you think he's going to open other doors too? Because Jesus said, I open and no man shutteth. Amen. I shut and no man opens. So, better drink this before it's gone. <laughs> If the door's wide open, go there. Right. Instead of just beating your head against the wall in some place where it's illegal, it's not safe, you know. It's just like in Phoenix here. What did we start with? Did we start in the hard part? Oh, let's start in Paradise Valley and Scottsdale. No, we started where? In the ghetto. Start where it's easy. Start with the low-hanging fruit. Then you go for the hard stuff. Then you go to the, the other countries. So we need to start with countries where it's receptive, safe, and legal because countries are constantly changing. You say, how can a country become receptive? Well, because God can send famine. God can send an economic downturn. God can humble people, and, and, and then they'll be ready to hear the gospel. Or other circumstances. We don't know how God can open the door, but he will. Look at Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, verse 46, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Why? Because the Gentiles are receptive. Because the Gentiles aren't trying to kill us. 
The Gentiles aren't throwing us in jail all the time. Say, well, you know, we're not, we're done with you. Now, unfortunately, Paul kept going back on this and trying to go back again to the Jews, you know, but that was his own human weakness. He should have stuck with this and just say, hey, we're going to the Gentiles. That's what God told him to do anyway. He said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, buddy. Keeps wanting to go back to Jerusalem. Go to the Gentiles. So go to 2 Corinthians 4 for conclusion. But one more thing I want to say about reaching the uttermost part of the earth with the gospel is that let's say we have these 53 great soul winning churches that, that we envision, right? If we have these 53 great soul winning churches and there are about 200 countries in the world, right? And out of these 200 countries in the world, half of them are receptive, safe, and legal. The other half, it could be illegal, unreceptive, not safe, just not, not a good option. So if you took the 100, the 50% of nations that are a good soul winning field, right? And you got 53 churches. Well, what if each of those 53 churches just picked four countries? And we don't have to all work together. We can all stay independent, but we can just talk to each other. Hey, we'll take these four. You got those four? Okay, great. If we all picked four countries to emphasize, one big country, one medium-sized country, and two small little countries and said, you know what, these are our main emphasis. You know, we want to do something for the whole world, but these are our four countries we really want to emphasize. We're going to be sending our full-time staff members there to preach and to teach. We're going to be planting churches there. We're going to make those our main emphasis. And if there's 50 churches doing that, then basically each of the receptive, safe, and legal countries is getting hit like twice by two different churches that are just targeting it. Hardcore, just targeting it, right? And then when those 50 churches start the other five in their state, then there's going to be 300 churches, right? 300 churches. And so each country's getting hit like seven or eight different churches just bombarding it. See what I'm saying? It, you could get it done, friend. It could work. If we would all be missions minded, if we would all get there. I'm not talking about sending $50 a month to some guy who's sitting in language school and writing prayer letters about people who almost got saved. I'm talking about people like us. People who go there and they find a way to get it done. They kick the door open. They get in there. They get in front of the guys like Richie Symes. Amen. Have you seen that guy on Facebook? Who knows Richie? He, he went to our church for like three months, but he's from West Virginia. That guy's over in the Philippines. And, and he's, I mean, he's going into schools. He's preaching to thousands of people. He's just, honestly, He's just an, a normal guy. He's just an average guy. He's newly married. What's, you know him a little bit, Garrett. How long has he been married? Probably a year or two. He's just a young guy. He's been married for a year, year or two. Unassuming guy. Average guy. The guy's over there just winning hundreds and hundreds of people to the Lord, going into schools and preaching to thousands of people. He's getting it done. Amen. That's the kind of guys we need. That's who we ought to support. That's who we ought to help. That's who we ought to work with. You know, you pick, let's say we pick four countries and said, okay, we're going to emphasize, you know, Mexico as a big job for us because we're right here in Arizona. It's right there, Me Mexico and Guyana and Botswana and, you know, and just pick like four countries say, and Malawi and, and those are our four places and we're going to hit these places hard. We're going to emphasize that. It could be done. So the conclusion is this question, will it happen? Will this actually happen, or is this just the rantings of a madman? I came to church on Sunday morning. I wanted to learn the Bible. I wanted to hear, and I heard the ramblings of a madman who, we're going to take over the entire world! <laughs> ourselves! We're going to do it ourselves! The question is, will this actually happen? Will it happen? And the answer to that question is, that it's up to us. It can happen. I believe that it will happen. But the question of whether it will happen is up to us. And again, I'm not saying everybody's going to get saved and the whole country's going to turn Christian. Broad's the way that leads to destruction. Many there be what's going on. I'm saying that we will get a clear presentation of the gospel to the whole world. Look, if people are going to go to hell, friend, people are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And that breaks my heart. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's sad. It's, it, it can be depressing to think too much about it. But you know what? 
it's a lot easier for me to think of it as, you know what, a lot of people are going to hell, but at least they all heard the gospel. Doesn't that make it a little easier to sleep at night when you realize that their blood's not on our hands? That makes it easier to deal with. But see, other people just want to hide from that and just they just won't preach about hell and just, oh, you know, let's just not talk about hell. No, 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 let's just, let's just get the gospel to every person. And then if they go to hell, their blood is on what? Their own heads at that point. They've heard a clear presentation of the gospel. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So how about you, friend? You say, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm not going to the Philippines. I'm not going to Malawi. You know, I'm just an average uh, child, boy, girl. I'm a housewife. I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. I'm a, a you know what? Why don't you become a 30-fold Christian? Why don't you make that your goal? Because you know what? If you could become a 30-fold Christian, you will do a lot toward this goal. You will be used greatly. And this, this work is not going to be done by one person. It's not going to be done by 53 great pastors, Superman. I'm not a Superman. People who know me in real life, they know me to be an average guy. Maybe even a little below average. No, I'm just kidding. I hope not. I'm saying they know me to be just a normal guy. I don't consider myself a great Christian. or I don't consider myself an A plus or even an A minus. Okay? I don't know what grade God would give me. I just hope I have a passing score. But the point is, it's not about one great leader, one great man, or, or 53 great talented men, and, and, and they're, 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 they're dressed like a million dollars, and they, they're, they're so eloquent, and their, their sermons are so you know, well put together and polished. It's, that's not who's going to get it done. You know who actually gets it done? Who actually gets it done are the lay people. Who actually gets it done are the boys and the girls and the teenagers and the ladies and the, and the tradesmen and the carpenter and the plumber and the electrician and the computer programmer that are just out there winning 30 people to the Lord every year. That's who's getting it done. It's those people that are going out there and busting their hump and winning 60 people to the Lord every year. That is who's getting the job done. That's who's going to get it done. And our job as preachers, my job... Brother Romero's job, Brother Burson's job. You know, our job is just to inspire you and also to model the way by going out ourselves and winning our 30, our 60, and our 100. Get you inspired, model the way, show you how to do it. Don't tell you how to do it, show you how to do it. And we will get it done collectively. And there's a part in this plan for every boy, every girl. Look, if you're just a child, you say, well, I'm a child. Okay, can you mentor another child? How about if you're 11 years old, you can take another 11-year-old in the church and instead of talking to them about a bunch of Hollywood movies, instead of talking to them about a bunch of video games, instead of talking to them about a bunch of stupid, worldly junk that means nothing, you know what you could do, 11-year-old child, 13-year-old child, 15-year-old child? What if you could take another teenager aside and say, you know what, why don't I make you a soul winner? I want a kid to the Lord on my street. Let me show you how to do it. Let me inspire you to do it. Let me exhort you to do it. Let me check up on you. Hey, did you win that guy to the Lord on your street? Did you win that kid to the Lord at the park? Hey, why don't you, no matter what your age, whether you're a lady, a man, why don't you decide I'm going to reproduce myself and have one person that I'm going to train to be just like me this year in 2017? I want to disciple someone. And I want to win 30 people to the Lord. And I want to teach other people to do the same thing. There's a part in this plan for everyone. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us work to do, Lord. We're, we're, we're on this earth not to just sit around until you come, but we are to occupy until you come. That is our occupation. That is our job, Lord, to reach the world with the gospel. Help every single person to have a part in it. Some will have a small part. Some will have a larger part, Lord. 
but help every single person that's under the sound of my voice right now to get a vision, to get inspired, and to start by just knocking that one door. Just, just to start by just being a silent partner. Just showing up and saying, hey, I'm just, I'm just along for the ride. Pair me up with somebody. I want to be a silent partner. And, and, and taking that first step, Lord. I pray that every single person in our church and in the other churches that we're friends with and that, that listen to us, Lord, I pray that everybody would get a vision for this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, we broke our attendance record this morning. How many did we have this morning? Who knows? You're ringing the bell, you're pointing at someone. Oh. 302, so that's our Sunday morning. I thought our record was already 302. Oh, it was 301. Now we had 302. Okay. So we had 302 in church this morning. That's our Sunday morning record. So that means we have ice cream for everybody after the service. So stick around for ice cream. Let's sing our last song before we go. When he cometh, song number 